Good evening, everybody. How are we all doing today? Um, this week in jazz, we lost one of the preeminent trombone players of the post-bebop era. Curtis Fuller was one of the great lyrical trombone players uh, who was able to play incredibly fast without forsaking melody. Uh, he is at the forefront of a lot of the great hard bop records of the late 50s. And whether it's his work with John Coltrane on Blue Train, his work with Benny Golson on Art Farmer at Argo, or his work with the Jazz Messengers and Blakey and Company in 60 through 64, 65. His, their, their work at Blue Note and Impulse is fantastic at that point. Uh, he also makes a lot of great records as a leader, Curtis Fuller does. Early stuff at Prestige, some great titles at Blue Note, uh, some fantastic stuff here at the Savoy label. He uh, ends up making a few records at Impulse and Epic as well. His body of work is really fantastic, Curtis Fuller. and. The, the trombone kind of becomes a forgotten instrument in jazz as we move into the 60s. It was a really predominant music in Dixieland, predominant instrument in swing, but as we moved into the hard bop and bebop, the trombone's an, in an instrument that's tough to translate bebop. J.J. Johnson does, does it really well. Jimmy Cleveland can play his ass off. Curtis Fuller, you know, there's other players. Julian Priester was a great player. Uh, there's a lot of, Al Gray is one of the most fantastic trombone players you'll ever hear, but it doesn't really lend itself to fast, viscous Clifford Brown style playing. And not very many guys could play the bone that fast, that clean. Uh, it's more of a blurting, rhythmic, sliding, organic sound. Uh, there's a lot of great sounds brought out in orchestras from the trombone, and it can be very deceptive. You cannot know often that that's a trombone making those sounds. It's a pretty fascinating instrument. <clears throat> Watching Treme, the HBO scene on Post Katrina New Orleans and the, and the jazz musicians and all the things that happened down there, there's a lot of great trombone playing on that show. A lot of it's in the Dixieland, some of it's more modern, and a lot of it has an R&B kind of jazz fusion crossover thing. But it's a fantastic show, highly recommend it. Uh, thank you to Russell Levi for recommending it to me. Great stuff. But. Uh, so we lost Curtis Fuller. He, again, he was with us for a long time. He continued to record and play well into his later years. And rest in peace, Curtis, you'll be missed. Uh, one of the last living legends of the Jazz Messengers, you know. I think Benny Golson's still with us, I think, you know. But uh, the, all the men from this time frame are disappearing. There's not a lot left. Secondly, I want to address, we lost Bob Coaster, Bob Coster who was the founder of the Jazz Record Mart in Chicago and the founder of Delmark Records out of Chicago. Delmark Records was a f uh, important jazz uh, and blues label in Chicago. They housed a lot of the great jazz musicians and blues musicians, especially from the Chicago scene. They also licensed a lot of material from artists as varied as Sun Ra. Uh, this is a fantastic session, of course. All the gin's gone with the great Jimmy Forrest. Wonderful Delmark record with the Delmark logo there. That's 404. 402 is the Iris Sullivan Quintet. This record, boy, this cooks. Great Johnny Griffin. Uh, great Jody Kristen. Vic Sproles. Well, it's a fantastic record. These records are fairly tough to come by. Uh, there's a great record from John Young, the piano player. That's fantastic. Another record, of course, by uh, another Iris Sullivan record. That's fantastic. It's more of a blues label. You know, the jazz record, there's a probably between 1960 and 1990, 2000, there's probably 40, 50 titles. And only a dozen or so kind of come from that golden era that I'm a big fan of. Uh, Bud Powell, they licensed some stuff of his and released it. Uh, so they have some pretty interesting people on the label. But we lost, he, uh, we lost Bob this week. He uh, was in his 80s, if I recall, had a stroke recently. He was... He bought a record store called. Oh, not man! I just I was just thinking about it a second ago. He bought a record store in Chicago on the north side of downtown, back in the mid '50s. Oh man, that's not Cedric or something like that. And uh, it's gonna come to me. I'll put. I'll type it in later. And he ends up build, buying a second location, making moving to a second location. They move around downtown a few times, but the Jazz Blues and Record Mart was one of the biggest specialized 
jazz and blues record stores anywhere in the world from what I understand. And uh, I shopped there many times in Chicago. Uh, it was a pretty unique space to get down to. And once you were in there, it was just expansive. And you could find some pretty cool stuff. And I wish I could shop there now knowing what I know now. I probably would have found a lot of great stuff uh, if I could have shopped there now with my knowledge and what I know and what I've found and what I you know, have collected off the internet. There was probably some great stuff there when I was going there 10, 15 years ago. Didn't even know about it. You know, I was still looking for Blue Notes and Impulse. Uh, which is, of course, the, the trajectory we all take. Uh, that eventually closed because the rents in downtown Chicago kept skyrocketing and skyrocketing. And he eventually moved to a small place over on the north side of the city. And uh, that was just called Bob's J Jazz Record. Something similar like that. Uh, sorry if I'm butchering that, but I shopped there a lot of times. Too much more cramped quarters. He was a great guy to talk to. He just knew the music. He was sharp as a tack. He'd yell at you to shut the door if, the, if a gust of wind was coming in, in a kind of bitter almost way. But he knew his stuff. He'd been around the scene for a long time. He came from St. Louis originally. Knew that Chicago was going to be a more important center of operation for him to start a label and to start a record store. And he's just a big part of the Chicago jazz and blues scene and thus part of the American music story. So we lost Bob as well this week, so rest in peace to both those guys. Uh, it's tragic, but it's part of the cycle of life. Obviously, not to be cliche, but uh, we lost a lot of great people this last few years, and I'm sure some of them wish they had lived a better life than what COVID's brought on for the last 14 months. It seems things are finally getting better, but it's a slow go. You know, I think here in America, we're going to finally start seeing things return to some kind of normalcy, it sounds like, but... I'm not, I'm alive, it doesn't give me a little bit of pause, you know, so here we are with that, rest in peace Bob, rest in peace Curtis. Next I want to talk to you about one of the best values in jazz, it's a group I love, they put a smile on my face just from the opening notes, and it's the three sounds, and boy, if there's an artist that's taken for granted in jazz circles, it's the three sounds. Gene Harris is outstanding. He's dynamic. He's rhythmic. He's pulsing. He's got the blues oozing through him. And Gene Harris, the piano player, the leader of the three sounds, stays with the jazz scene well into the 90s and continues to develop and become one of the preeminent piano players of his era. Uh, Gene was a fantastic player. And I love a lot of his different eras that I've gotten into. But for me, the three sounds is the birth of it all. And he makes some early recordings at Jubilee. But it's when he comes to Blue Note and he brings in Dickie Simpkins and uh, Bill Dowdy. Uh, Andrew Simpkins and Bill Dowdy. And that trio makes 20 records for Blue Note from probably 1957, 58 through into the late 60s. And these records sold well. They were cool. They were hip. They were well designed. The songs were selected in that were going to be hip, but swinging and ready for a jukebox 45. And because these records sold well, it means that there's a lot of them out there still. And collectors don't value them because these records don't go for 200 bucks. There's too many of them on Discogs and eBay for you to ask for more than 30, 40 bucks for a nice copy of these records. Or else you're just not going to sell it. And in today's collector driven consumer market, something that doesn't fetch high value doesn't seem to attain value. And I'm here to tell you that's wrong. If you put on a three sounds record, you will tap your foot, you will nod your head. Your guests will enjoy it and thank you. And next thing you know, you'll be imbibing. The groove is the groove. The blues is the blues. The feel is the feel. And these records are meant to just be intoxicating. They bubble with jazz. They bubble with life. Harris has this kind of excitement, exuberance that comes through the sparkling water that is his fountain of life. He's just a, ah, if you hear that tinkling of rain, 
He's just bringing all kinds of wonderful patterns. Long, lyrical, Art Tatum-like lines, but more in the pocket, more... Uh, there's a lot of kind of accents within his lines. There'll be notes that kind of accent, and the other ones will kind of just lay back in the cut. Art Tatum was really long and clear all the way through. And then Monk's really choppy with his accents and diminuendos and crescendos. He's kind of in the middle where he'll give you a, a percussive note and then kind of do some long, softer ones and then kind of a louder couple. It's an interesting swirl of adrenaline that he creates just through his dynamic touch. And it's part of the excitement of a Three Sounds record is watching Gene Harris propel your ear through the sonic soda bottle that is the Three Sounds sound. Uh, it's Alka-Seltzer Sprite in your eardrum. It's fantastic. And I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of so many of the Three Sounds records. You can go and you can get them for 15, 20 bucks. You will play them over and over and over and enjoy them. They're not ever campy or corny. They're real black groove rhythm and blues jazz that has a real amount of soul and feeling and from the gut. So it's never gonna come across as corny and, and canned, like some capital Joel Bushkin or some just something really refined. It's not refined. It's loose. It's expressive. It's within the moment telling you how it feels. It's such a treat. And I have mo probably most of the three sounds work. And they end up going to Mercury, make a few things in a few other places. But it's really, and of course, Gene Harrison worked on Concord in the 80s and 70s is outstanding. But these records, it's just fizzing. Did you hear all the bubbles? Did you, did you hear the life that's coming from that piano right now? He's not playing. He's not pretending. He's not trying to force your hand. He's just feeling it like he's feeling it. And you can either get with it and recognize it, or you can pass it over and think you know too much. And think, well, you know, I better buy this $70 record because it's rare. And have fun. Have fun. And that's what the three sounds are about. It's about a joyful expression of life and self and just living within a joyous moment in spite of the expensive cost of living and the sorrow of the day this kind of washes all that away and I think everybody enjoys the three sounds they just don't know it it's, it's so much more meat on the bone than people want to recognize and you can go on Discogs right now and buy five of their records for a hundred bucks. Original Blue Notes. You know, they're not that expensive. They're out there. Uh, they don't get reissued the same way because they don't need to be. They're out there. Like Jimmy Smith records. And Jimmy Smith is this virtuoso that's this dynamic organ bop playing volcano. The three sounds are more, you're in a smoky basement. There's a candle on the table. There's a trio on the stage and just, shh, just listen. They got you. They're going to do it. They're going to paint it for you. They're going to bring you to that place you need to go to. They got you. They know how this works. They've been doing this a long time. And so I can't recommend enough the Three Sounds. Go out there, find a Three Sounds record. Play it twice. Listen to it all the way through twice. And tell me you didn't enjoy it. For the value you get for your dollar, three sounds is at the top of the charts. You don't get a lot more bang for your buck than a Gene Harris record for $25. I DJ a lot of times with jazz records if the, if the gig uh, calls for it, if it's the right place, the right venue, the right time of day. I bring a couple three sounds records every time. I know I could put on this piano, blues, lounge, cocktail, but soulful trio and it will draw people in. I've watched it do its magic infinite times. Do yourself a favor, get yourself some three sounds.
you won't, re you won't regret it. And you'll have a couple original blue notes to boot. Bonus. My name is Dan. I'm the Jazz Shepherd. Stay tuned. I got some great stuff coming. I'm also in the process of reorganizing my vinyl, my jazz records. I'm going back to sorting it out by label. I'm going to lay that out for you and show it to you when it's done. It's resorted, but I still got to do some filing. I got to make some labels and stuff for the shelving. So it's you know, probably be a few weeks before I'm ready to show you. But I'm excited about it. It's nice to see stuff by label again to really get the story. And I've been feeling a lot of the in-between the crack labels and learning the story. There's the, the Max labels, the Capitals, Columbia's, the Decca's, the RCA's. There's the Mid-Majors, the Blue Notes, the Riverside's, the Verbs, the Impulses. But there's all these small labels that had maybe a half dozen, maybe three important jazz albums that are part of the canon, but it makes that label of interest. So I'm trying to find these little labels and find their few most important records. And I plan on showing you some of that stuff in the coming weeks as well. So you all stay tuned. We got some fun stuff coming along, as well as we're gonna dig into a few more uh, 12 or 24 records to start a library for Atlantic. We'll probably do Pacific and Contemporary, maybe do those together, I'm not sure. I might just do a West Coast one, we'll see. Um, I got a lot of fun stuff coming. So y'all stay tuned, peace.